So, for the last four months, if I haven't been playing a game for this channel, chances are that I've been playing Overwatch. There are a few games in recent memory that have commanded my attention so thoroughly and consistently than Blizzard's new IP, but I've struggled to find much to say about it for a lot of reasons. Mainly because it's hard for me to discuss a game that's only interested in crafting robust mechanics without any serious focus on story, pacing, or tone. However, the fact that Overwatch has been able to keep not only me, but such a broad variety of gamers of all skill levels and tastes enchanted for so long means that there's something here worth discussing. It took me a long time of playing it to put my finger on it, but it was around the time I switched between Soldier 76, Farah, and Mercy over the course of one match that something clicked with me. While it undeniably pulls a good deal of its ability design and team focus from MOBAs, and while it brings plenty of its own ideas to the table, Overwatch's staying power first and foremost comes from the fact that it is the ultimate love letter to competitive FPS games, of which it has pulled from every major release since the advent of gaming. What I'm about to say will be a statement that a lot of people disagree with, but by and large, I stand by it. The three most important multiplayer FPS of modern gaming are Call of Duty, Team Fortress 2, and Counter-Strike. Admittedly, there are other games that have had very similar influences to these three, such as Call of Duty for Battlefield, Team Fortress for Quake 3, and Counter-Strike for any number of the Tom Clancy games. But I choose these three because they are currently the most popular titles of their subgenres. And it's these three subgenres that inform Overwatch's design. Of these games, Overwatch freely borrows ideas from all three, ranging from weapon mechanics to match design to movement. Even if Overwatch didn't want to, it would have to pull ideas from Call of Duty to be what it wants to be. For all of the very just criticisms that there are to be had of Call of Duty, it doesn't change that it is by far the most popular FPS out there. As such, any FPS aiming to grab a broad audience would be naive not to look at what it does so well. This fact is not lost on Overwatch. It's very telling that the character who you play as in the tutorial is Soldier 76, who, more than anyone else, brings a set of COD-esque mechanics to the game. While he may lack iron sight aiming, every move in his kit serves to make him into Overwatch's version of a stock COD character. He comes equipped with a stock assault rifle, a noob tube, a sprint, and his biotic field serves as a means to give the players a version of regenerating health without changing the core mechanics for just one player. More than anything else, it serves to introduce Overwatch using a set of mechanics that the largest number of players is most likely to be familiar with. It also eagerly takes COD's level unlocks and kill cams to lend to its engaging game feel. But if Overwatch uses COD as the canvas to pull its audience in, then TF2 is its paint. Of the 23 playable characters, 15 pull clear influence from TF2's core 9. Fair is the logical in conclusion of a rocket jumping soldier, the scout grandfathers in tracer speed, reaper shotguns in a brief moment of invincibility, and, to a much lesser degree, Genji's mobility, while Mei is debatably a less miserable version of the pyro to fight against. Though whether or not you think that's true largely depends on what side of that weapon you wind up on. The charges and melee swings of Reinhardt can be traced back to the Scotsman Demoman, while the Demoman's core moveset of arcing grenades and triggered explosives have found their home in Junkrat. Meanwhile, the Heavy's machine gun and sandwich have been handed to Bastion, and while the Heavy's slow movement speed while firing and general bulkiness has in many ways been handed to every tank that isn't Zarya, it shines most clearly in D.Va. From there, Torbjorn steals the Engineer's turrets, resource management, and gun, while Symmetra takes the teleporter and, in an upcoming patch, will also snag his stationary support building. Mercy is so close to being the stock medic that it's approaching copyright infringement, while Anna takes his Crusader's crossbow mechanic of shooting allies to heal them. Widowmaker is essentially the stock sniper, while Hanzo is essentially the huntsman sniper. And finally, the recently added Sombra stole the spy's invisibility and sapping abilities. Also, while not a TF2 weapon, Zarya's primary fire can trace its roots back to Quake's lightning gun. I figure it's worth mentioning here given TF2's own Quake roots. One thing I want to make clear though is that Overwatch is by no means a TF2 ripoff. Even discounting the core game structure differences that I will get into, there's no sidestepping that every Overwatch hero has a toolkit that is far expanded beyond their inspirations. As many hours as I put into Soldier and TF2, I think I'll always find Farrah to be more exciting to play because of the flight and rocket barrage available to her. There are no direct transplants here, despite what some bitter TF2 fans may tell you. Widowmaker's rifle may charge like the snipers, but he will never have access to her grappling hook and spider mines. 
These additions allow Overwatch to stand on the shoulders of giants while feeling like an experience all its own by taking characters that have stood the test of time and proven easy to learn for nearly a decade and breathing new and original life into them. Despite all of this, the most important thing that TF2 may have inspired in Overwatch are the core gameplay modes. Its lack of any classic deathmatch mode while focusing on King of the Hill and payload pushing is a clear Team Fortress transplant. While King of the Hill has been a style of game before TF2 and, indeed, before even video games, I struggle to think of any mainstream game before TF2 that opted to make it one of its primary game modes. It had been around for a lot of games before that, but it had been reserved to just a sideshow. Likewise, Payload and the way that Overwatch does it didn't really exist before TF2. Escort quests have been in-game since time immemorial, but it was TF2 that made that escort target an unkillable object. However, while Overwatch eagerly takes its game modes and many of its characters from TF2, it also seeks to be a competitive esport. And this is where the Counter-Strike influence begins to shine through. Unlike COD and TF2, Counter-Strike has been refined with the intent of making it the ultimate competitive FPS. And given its popularity as an esport, it's hard to deny that they've done a great job of it, and Overwatch recognizes this. As such, it takes one major idea that contributes heavily to its competitive nature its small team size. While the current competitive TF2 scene also chooses this focus on restricted team size, this decision finds its roots in competitive Counter-Strike. The more players any game has in any given match, the less likely team coordination is to happen, and the more likely it is a player will die from randomness instead of any fault of their own. Likewise, it makes watching the game as a spectator far more enjoyable. Watching one-on-one -on -one matches turns every game into baseball, with momentary spikes of excitement followed by long periods of inaction. Meanwhile, following matches of 10v10 turns every game into a functional riot, with so much going on at any given moment that it's nearly impossible to keep track of it all as either a spectator or a player. Teams of that size also eliminate the need for any strategic weapon or character choices, as you'll have so many options available to you that you'll never need to specialize. I can count on one hand the amount of times I saw people asking others to switch classes for the sake of team balance in TF2 prior to the competitive update. However, if the team size is too small, you will inevitably begin to see the same two or three cookie cutter builds take over the meta. We already see this happening with Overwatch's newly introduced 3 vs 3s and Pharah, Mercy, Reinhardt compositions rising to prominence there. 5 to 6 seems to be the magic number. It's small enough that it's easy for everyone involved to be able to follow, but large enough that there's a constant stream of action and freedom for teams to experiment with their composition without falling into dominant strategies. And this is key to why Counter-Strike has been so successful as an esport. This also has a knock-on effect of making each player more valuable. In a large 10v10 game, if you lose one player, it's frankly not that big of a deal. 9 vs 10 may not be the best situation to be in, but it's by no means horrible. 5 vs 6, however, is a much more one-sided engagement. It doesn't put you at anywhere near the kind of disadvantage that a 2 vs 3 would put you at, but it will be an uphill battle and you will feel that. For a spectator, this means that these fights will be especially exciting. And for a player, this means that you will be doing everything you can to take care of and protect your teammates because each one is so vital. And this leads back into incentivizing you to work together as well as you can. Also, quick side note while we're still on the subject of Counter-Strike, I think it's worth pointing out that McCree is essentially a flashbanging headshot fishing deagle user. I do want to be clear, I know that Overwatch owes a lot to MOBAs as well. Hell, Roadhog is essentially mid-pudge with a bottle, and this isn't even mentioning the importance of cooldown management and the sheer existence of alts. And likewise, it has a lot of ideas all its own. I may not be a big fan of playing him, but I struggle to think of any character in any shooter that handles like Winston. And I never would have expected any character like Lucio to find his way into a competitive FPS. But the more I examine it, the more I feel like, while I love those elements, they aren't what keep me playing Overwatch. The reason I keep playing is because it has seamlessly taken countless elements from so many of my favorite shooters and brought them under a charismatic, colorful roof. The reason I keep playing is because it is everything I love about multiplayer shooters condensed into one game which then adds its own spin on every one of those elements. The reason I keep playing Overwatch is because, simply put, when it has everything I want, why would I play anything else?